Okay, good morning and welcome everybody to BC 308, our class on Revelation. And Daniel, thank you for connecting to the class today. Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll get started. Could somebody please pray with the class? Who would like to pray? Come below. Uh, Did she break my mic? Asha, okay, go Asha. Pray, go ahead. No, but can she break my mic because her mic isn't working? Okay, please. Thank you, Pastor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Um, thank you, Lord, that um, we're going to learn more about uh, your word and that uh, you're imparting more revelations to us, God. Um, thank you for um, helping us prepare uh, to live righteously, to live um, honorably before you. And um, God, uh, I pray that uh, you would just uh, continue to just uh, teach us and to guide us, to lead us, Lord. Um, Thank you, God, for uh, helping us, Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Man. Okay, thank you. All right. Amen. Man. So, once again, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining the class. We, as we said uh, last week, we will have three hours of lectures today uh, because we have completed the other course. So, uh, we will just continue here uh, uh, in the same classroom uh, for three hours. We'll, of course, we'll have our usual breaks, every 10 minutes, 10 minutes break. So let's get going. We have been journeying through Revelation. We came till Revelation chapter 9, and we stopped at verse number 12. So that's where we paused last week, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 12. So we are in the place where the, um, the trumpets, the seven trumpet judgments are being sounded one after the other. And each trumpet is indicating a certain judgment that or certain thing that's happening. Revelation chapter 9, and uh, Revelation uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, is the fifth angel sounding the trumpet. So it describes what happens. We are still in the first part of the seven-year tribulation. So when we look at the seven years of tribulation, the middle is three and a half years. And we are still in the first part of, of, of I mean, we're in the first half, that's the first three and a half years of the tribulation. So what has happened in the first three and a half years, starting uh, um, Revelation chapter four and five gives us a scene of what's happening in heaven, worship going on, so on. Revelation chapter six starts off with the scene here on earth, what's going on here on earth. So Revelation six, uh, we see in Revelation 6, we see the seven seals uh, being opened, Revelation chapter 6. And um, it begins with the man on the white horse, uh, which we said was the Antichrist. And then there are certain things happening here on earth. Revelation 7, uh, the 144,000 Jews who've been marked by God to serve him. Now, both in Revelation 6 and Revelation 7, we see many people dying uh, for their faith uh, in the tribulation, and they are all coming up into heaven. Revelation 8, uh, we see the um, uh, this uh, big prayer movement happening on earth. An angel throws a censer full of incense, which incense is representing prayer, prayers. 
and that is thrown to the earth and there's a lot of the prayers of the saints are rising up into heaven so that's what we say that that describes a prayer movement on the earth during that time of the tribulation then revelation 8 we see the after seven seals are over seven trumpet judgments begin to be sounded one after the other that brings us into revelation 9 and we're going to pick up now from verse 13 which is the sixth angel now so we come to the sixth trumpet okay so there are seven seals seven trumpets and seven bowls uh, seven three sets of seven judgments we are now in the sixth trumpet judgment now why am I emphasizing it because after the sixth we can see that uh, we will come into the middle of the tribulation the seventh trumpet comes in the second half of the tribulation just an interesting point to remember okay so the sixth trumpet happens before the middle of the tribulation seventh trumpet happens on the other side the second half how will we know it we will see as we keep reading right so verse 13 to 21 that is the sixth angel or the sixth trumpet could somebody read uh, can we take uh, sorry can we take turns uh, three verses each uh, verse 13 to verse 21 revelation chapter 9 uh, everybody's with me any questions so far on the on the, on the previous what we have covered so far okay let's read then let's go ahead we'll move forward Starting from verse 13, please. Revelation chapter 9. Somebody could start. Three verses each. Revelation chapter 9, verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river before us. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Was 16 someone? Anyone else? Now the number of uh, of the army of horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth, blue and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. Out of their mouths came fire, smoke and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and brimstone which came out of their mouths. Amen. Thank you. Verse 19 on, somebody please. 19 to 21. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads and when they do the harm but the nest but the, the rest of the mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of the work of their hands and they should not worship demons and idols of gold silver brass stone and wood which can neither see nor hear or walk and they did not repent of their murder murders or their sorceries or, or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Thank you. Thank you. So, this sixth trumpet is talking about the release of angels that were bound to the river Euphrates. Now, this is very strange. Now, what does this mean? And I'm not sure you know we we can fully understand it other than we can make some or we can deduce a few things now 
first of all, you know, the question we have to ask is, are these good angels or are these bad angels? Because we see both good angels and bad angels operating throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, we see good angels, they're doing God's work, they're sounding the trumpets, they're marking the head of the servants of God and all of those things. They're, they're doing their part. Then there are bad angels or evil spirits being released. So, you know, so that's the first question. Hey, how are these angels that are being released from this, uh, these four angels that are being released from the great river Euphrates, are they good or bad? Second, why does it say that they were bound at the great uh, river Euphrates, and they were bound there until this moment when something had to be take place. That's the next question. Now we don't have clear-cut answers to these questions, but we can make some deductions. First, by inference, we can say that these are most likely bad angels because they're being released to cause, you know, the destruction that is described thereafter. Whereas the good angels are either announcing judgment, they or they are doing, you know, certain things like marking people on their foreheads, or uh, you know, bringing a scroll to be eaten, or or answering John's questions and so on. So this is only by inference. It's likely that these four angels are bad angels, demonic powers. The second, to answer the second question is, what does it mean that these angels were bound to the river Euphrates for that moment in time when this, you know, what, what was described here in Revelation 9, uh, 13 to 21 should take, uh, should take place? Well, again, here we can make some deductions and uh, what we can say is we do know from scripture that uh, fallen angels, especially fallen angels, are territorial. That means they, for whatever reason, they are assigned to specific territory. And we see this especially in Daniel chapter 10, where when Daniel has been fasting and praying, there is angel Gabriel coming in to bring his message, bring God's message or answer to him. And along the way, he, he has to face opposition from the prince of Persia, from the prince of Greece. And uh, we can understand that these are opposing spirits, or opposing demonic powers, angels, uh, that, are hit, that, were, that were trying to prevent Gabriel from coming through. And these, they, they, are, they are territorial. That means there was this angel of, of the ruler of Persia, of Greece, and then this angel Gabriel says, Michael came and helped me, right? So we can see that angels are territorial. Michael is Israel's prince or Israel's angel. So that's the second deduction we can make, meaning these angels, Revelation, back in Revelation 9, verse 14 and 15, that these angels were territorial. That means they were operating there in the region of the river Euphrates, Middle East, just like the ruler of Persia and the ruler of Greece, demonic angels or demonic powers. So they are territorial and they are attached to that geography. They are there, they're operating there. So that's what it means, they're bound to the river Euphrates. And Euph river Euphrates is significant because from there a lot of things originated. The Garden of Eden was around that region, Tower of Babel around that region, uh, so very significant. Abraham called out of that region. So the river Euphrates is very significant, and these are demonic angels assigned to that territory. And now God is saying, just release them so that they can do, you know, what they're going to do. And that's what happens. Again, this is not answering the question completely. These are just deductions we can make because we don't have complete information on this. But the outcome is described here. Like when these four angels are released from their, their region in around the Euphrates, they go and they what they do results, as in verse 15, one third of mankind is killed. That means 30% of Earth's population are destroyed. 30%. 
we all, we're talking almost about almost uh, I mean we don't know the, uh, if you're talking about current population about eight billion people you're talking about, about two you know um, almost a little over two billion people being destroyed by what these angels do or cause to happen now what do they do you know it's described here they instigate verse 17 horses verse 16 says there's an army of horsemen 200 million so horsemen means uh, uh, of course remember we, we had to translate it god is showing things in a way john can understand it doesn't literally mean horsemen as in how we would understand today because uh, there is no country uh, that has 200 million horses as part of their infantry. Yeah, uh, you know, most countries don't have infantry or they would have very small infantry, more for moving, you know, certain kinds of people around, but not as part of their uh, uh, defense. But here he's talking about 200 million horsemen who are going to go and cause destruction so we have to interpret it translate it that this is describing some sort of a military strength because horsemen in John's understanding would represent military power those days horsemen would I mean soldiers would go out on horses and fight but not so today but the understanding is conveyed that this is some sort of a huge huge army and the destruction is described for us in verse 17 and 18 and you know John is seeing all these things happening he is seeing sulfur red blue yellow uh, smoke and fire and brimstone now John, in his time, had no idea of, you know, what today we would call as atomic warfare, nuclear, nuclear warheads, and uh, the kind of weapons that we have, which can actually create this effect of verse 17. Right? John had no idea. Those days, they didn't have those kinds of weaponry. But he's just describing what he's seeing. He's seeing this huge military army going around, and he is seeing. Um, you know this this things happening fire smoke and brimstone and he's trying to describe this again in verse 18 there is fire smoke and brimstone but he's trying to describe it it looks strange he says, look these things look strange they look like lions with heads and you know they've got these serpent like tails and so on right so you can imagine if you see an arm if john was seeing and an armored tank with this big, you know, going out on the ground. You know, how would he describe it? He has no point of reference to describe it. He would say lion, or <laughs> you know, he's trying to describe it in terms of animals. He knows, you know, but that's how he's uh, capturing it. But we can, when we read verses, you know, sixteen through nineteen, uh, we can understand it in our terms that here is a military power that's causing so much destruction the destruction is very much like what we would see uh, through the kind of warfare that's so possible today and the quantum of destruction also is so big we're talking about 30 percent of human population being destroyed which is very possible today with a kind of weapons that can cause mass destruction right so to sum up verse 13 the sixth trumpet causes the release of demonic powers that are look that were, that have been so far localized to the euphrates region but they are released from there and they are causing a global uh, 
are, are something huge where there are 200 million an army of 200 million soldiers or people of war whether they are all from one nation or not we don't know uh, this because of the number 200 million many, many you know many Bible teachers will say this kind of has a reference to China because there's if there was if there's any nation that has such a uh, a huge army that's China uh, they have 200 million plus armed personnel they can mobilize them so this is just by inference okay it's not from you know it's not directly mentioned so they say okay this is probably talking about an army like the army that China has the People's Republic of China you know that huge number of people so whether it's just one nation or whether it's a multitude of nations joining together the result is 30 percent of human population are destroyed by the weapons that are being used at that time what is interesting verses 20 and 21 revelation 9 is that people are seeing all this the rest of mankind meaning people are seeing all this happening they are experiencing the plagues they are seeing all this destruction happening yet John reports and he records that people are not repenting. They're continuing to worship demons, they're continuing in idol worship, uh, they're continuing to uh, in their evil works of murders and sorceries and immorality and so on. In other words, there is going to be a group of while on one side we see people coming to faith in Christ, prayers rising up, people being martyred for their faith. On the other side, we are also seeing people who are just hardening their hearts and refusing to turn to God. Okay, so that brings us to the end of Revelation chapter 9. Any questions on the sixth trumpet? Shri Kumar, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. So I want to know that when the when we say that angel uh, angels um, they blew the trumpet, so is it is it really they will blow the trumpet? We can able to hear it. Even the Bible says that the last trumpet. Uh, so is it there any specific timings are there that when the first trumpet, second trumpets will be will be blown? Or uh, is it going to happen only after the rapture? Is it like that? I just want to know. Or can we hear it also? Thank you. Um, okay. So, in the spiritual world, there is sound. Just like there is sound in the natural world. Right? Because we see John, uh, we see others. Uh, Paul and Ezekiel and other prophets, of, you know, in the Old Testament as well, they talk about, they describe sound in the spiritual world or in their spiritual encounters. Just like there are colors in the spiritual world, there is material in the spiritual world. Uh, except that all of this is in a different dimension than what we are used to. For example, when we talk about sound, uh, for us, sound cannot happen in vacuum. It ha requires a medium. Medium is air, and so um, so there is sound in the natural realm. That's how sound happens in the natural realm. But in the spiritual realm, there is sound, but it's different. Meaning, it doesn't require a medium to be transported. Uh, we don't. You know, so, and there are colors and all of that. So, to answer your question, is this sound? Yes. Is this audible from a spiritual standpoint? Yes, because in, in the book of Revelation itself, we see John says, I heard a voice and I turned and looked, meaning there was a sound. There was also a sense of direction. It came from behind. So he turned around to look. Right? And this was in his spiritual experience. It was not on the earth, but it was in the spiritual realm. So we can say that even in the spiritual realm, there is sound, there is direction, there is so on and so forth, colors and all. So. Uh, that's uh, so John's question is the sound yes now the question is um, you know is there a timing 
the answer is yes, because we see that there is a sequence to these trumpets. They're not being sounded arbitrarily, but God has determined when they have to be sounded, and these angels are following the, the sequence or you know the, the plan of God. Uh, whether they are un un opening up the seals or sounding the trumpets, and as we go along, we will see more. Uh, there will be seven thunders, there will be seven bowls, uh, they're all following the sequence that God wants them to follow. So it's not happening arbitrarily, but they are timed according to the plan of God. Okay. So is it happen after the rapture? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. So uh, keep in mind, Book of Revelation, the sequence. Remember what we said. Till Revelation chapter 3 were things of the past. From chapter 4 are things into the future. And what we said was chapters 4 and 5 are giving us a picture of heaven after the rapture. The rapture has happened. Chapter 4 verse 1. Okay, so you can, you can, you know, we can uh, put some um, uh, events in chronological order through the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation in our minds, must be very clear. It's chronological. And there's a time sequence to it, meaning it's not just a, a mishmash of events. It's a chronological unveiling of events, meaning it's happening in the sequence. Chapters 4 and 5 is right after the rapture in heaven. Chapter 6 is right after the rapture on earth. Chapter 6, verse 1. And everything that happens from there on is a sequence of events that are happening all during the seven-year tribulation. So Revelation, chapter 6, verse 1, till the end of chapter 19, is a seven-year period, the tribulation. Right? It should be very clear in our minds. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now we come to, so we are still in the first half of the tribulation. That means we haven't reached the three and a half year mark, right? So the rapture has happened, tribulation has started, Revelation 6 verse 1, and we are here now. So, uh, you know, a, a good, good, um, uh, you know, reference points. Revelation 4 verse 1. Big, the the rapture, Revelation six verse one, the beginning of tribulation here on earth, Revelation eleven verse one, the middle of the tribulation. These are good reference points to keep, right? Um, so we are still, you know, before the middle of the tribulation. So in chapter ten, uh, we call it a parenthetical chapter, meaning. Uh, it's an, a, a description of something that John is experiencing while he's getting the vision of the future. So in Revelation 10, 1, uh, there is something that happens in heaven. Uh, there are seven thunders, but God says, don't record that. You know, don't record the seven thunders, just leave it. So John doesn't record. After that, He's given a book to eat. So we know that, you know, uh, from the Old Testament, even Ezekiel had an experience like that. God told Ezekiel to eat a scroll. And that's symbolic of God saying, I want you to receive my word so you can prophesy some more. The scroll or the little book represents prophecy or prophetic message. And God says, take it, receive it, so that you can prophesy some more. So it's a parenthetical chapter, meaning John has this experience, and then he goes on to prophesy. So let's look through, let's read through Revelation 10. Let's read uh, verses, let's read first, verses 1 to 7, please. Revelation 10, verses 1 to 7, three verses each, please. Revelation 10. I felt still another mighty angel 
coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven, and so by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seven angel. When he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Mm, thank you. So, John is continuing to see the vision, see his visions, and he sees something spectacular. He's seeing an angelic being who is so big now so that you know that makes us think how big are angels because typically when we read about angels in, in scripture they, they they appear like human beings they, they seem to be the same height and the you know the same stature as human beings so in our minds we think okay angels are like that and then when we see, maybe when we see uh, some plays or dramas done in church, then angels are little, little babies or little, little kids with little wings. And so in our mind, oh, angels are these tiny little things. But actually, John says here in Revelation 10, I saw a mighty angel. And this angel is so big. He's like his head is up in a way. It's like the sun and the clouds, and and his feet are like pillars of fire. One hand on the sea, and one I mean one one feet one feet on the sea, and one feet on the land. That's huge. So, how big are angels? Uh, we have no idea. It's likely that by the things we see described in scripture when they come to visit when they come to bring messages when they come to visit people they come in a form that we could relate to so that we are not overwhelmed but we will see here in revelation 10 that these angels could be extremely huge and powerful now there's no way to get a grasp of the measure of of the size of this angel but john is describing what he saw he saw a very big powerful mighty messenger and angel and at that moment he's hearing things which to him sounds like thunders but they are intelligent that means the sounds he hears which on the one hand he he describes it as like seven thunders uh, and uh, this angel is crying out with a loud voice like a lion roaring and at that same time this was three there are like seven thunders he's hearing the sound but yet that sound is intelligent because he says, I hear their voices. And he was ready to write the voice of the seven thunders, what he heard, the message he received through the voice of the thunders. So on the one hand, the sound is very powerful, very majestic. So he's using the word thunders to describe how it is, or like the lion roaring. 
you know. So he's using those terms to describe how majestic and powerful the, the sound is. But it's also a voice, meaning it's communicating something very intelligent. It's communicating a message, which John understands. And he wants to write it down, right? So he wants to record it, and God says, don't do it. Right? So don't record it. Now, why is it that God would tell John, John, don't record it? There's no reason given. God just wants to keep that secret. And the Bible tells us the secret things belong to the Lord, which means there are many things that are not revealed to us that are kept secret. And God just, okay, God says, okay, I, I, you don't need to know these things. So God tells John, John, don't, there's no need to record it. Just let it go. So even the Apostle Paul, from his experience in 2 Corinthians, the uh, 12th chapter, he says, you know, I, I, I was caught up to the third heaven and I heard of things which I can't even express, I can't even explain. So while the Apostle Paul recorded so much revelation for us, it's very possible that the, the, he saw and he heard and experienced so much more than what he was, what he communicated to the church through his epistles, meaning there's so much more that we don't know. So God is telling John, John, I don't want you to write these things. And then this angel, this, this mighty angel, has one announcement to make. So this is a messenger angel. And this angel is saying basically this. This is verse number seven. This mighty angel is saying, the meaning he's announcing that we are getting close to the end. And he's saying there should be delay no longer. Look, you're coming close to the end. And he's saying, from the time the seven, seventh angel sounds, this is verse 7, the days, that means, okay, there's a little time, days, plural. He didn't say day or hour. He said days, plural. So there's a little time, very little time. From the time the seventh angel sounds till the end for all the prophecies to be fulfilled. So literally, this marks the middle of the seven-year tribulation. Because when we start chapter 11, verse 1, you will see very clearly it is stated it's the middle. Okay, so the sixth trumpet is sounded just before the middle, and then there's this angel that this mighty angel that comes to John and says, John, or he's making the announcement saying, From the time the seventh trumpet sounds, so the seventh trumpet happens after the middle of the tribulation. From the time the seventh trumpet sounds, the days are very short. It's, there will be no more delay for all the prophecy to be fulfilled. Literally, there's only three and a half years left. So, that's what happens. And then, let's read verses 8 to 11, please. Somebody could read verses 8 to 11 of Revelation 10. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It, tis it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophes prophesy again about many people, nations, languages, and kings. Mm. Thank you. So here, once again, you know, it's like a parallel experience to Ezekiel. John, in his spiritual room, it's a spiritual experience. It's not like, it's not a physical experience, not in the natural. 
but in the spiritual the angel says hey there's a book you got to eat it and uh, so John eats the book it's sweet in his mouth but becomes very bitter when it gets into his stomach and then he says you got to prophesy so the book so this this spiritual experience eating a book so keep this in mind if you have a dream of eating a book or somebody tells you a dream of eating a book or you see a vision of somebody eating a book it's a prophetic symbolism of God giving you a message that is to be proclaimed a prophetic message so John has this vision of eating a book it's sweet initially because it's a message from God but it's bitter because the content of that message is judgment and destruction what's going to happen the next three and a half years is going to be the great tribulation we are in the tribulation but the second half of the tribulation is called the great tribulation so he says look you're going to prophesy it's going to be bitter and it's concerning you know people all over the world so that's chapter 10 it's a parenthetical chapter it's an experience john has seeing this big mighty angel who says hey look from the time the seventh angel's trumpet sounds, things are going to happen very fast, no more delay. And John has this experience of eating a book, saying, you've got to prophesy some more. Uh, but it's bitter. It's very, it's judgment that you're going to prophesy. So think about some things here. In spiritual things, taste has meaning sweetness and bitterness bitterness has meaning it means you're going to prophesy judgment you're going to prof you know you're going to prophesy things that are one, one meaning of bitterness is judgment coming the word of god is like honey but prophecy concerning judgment bitter taste so keep that in mind so in the spiritual tastes have meaning smells odors have meaning if it's a pleasant smell prayers are like incense incense means sweet smelling believers in Christ are like a sweet aroma to those who also believe but then aroma of death to those who don't believe so there is smell in the spiritual that has meaning taste in the spiritual also has meaning so sometimes if you get that you know like hey I'm getting some sort of a funny taste of funny smell and it's not natural but it's something in the spirit then you understand that the fragrance the kind of smell also will tell you what God is saying or what God is doing so we come now to chapter 11 okay any questions so far till end of chapter 10 okay so now we come into chapter 11 okay now let's read chapter 11 and we will read verses 1 through 6 please revelation 11 1 through 6 three verses each somebody could read so then i was given a measuring rod like a staff and i was told rise and measure the temple of god and the altar and those who worship there but do not measure the court outside the temple leave that out for it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months and i will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth thank you thank you verses 4 to 6 somebody please
These are the two olive trees, and the two lambs that are standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. This have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the day of their prophesy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they deserve. Mm. Thank you. Now, how can we say Revelation chapter 11 is the middle of the tribulation? You know, I said very confidently, you can make these, you know, reference points. Revelation 6 verse 1, the beginning of the tribulation. Revelation 11 verse 1 is the middle of the tribulation. Why can we say that? Well, it tells us very clearly. Verse 2 says, they will, talking about the temple, he talks about the, the city will, and the holy city will be trodden underfoot for 42 months. And verse 3 says, 1260 days. So 42 months, 1260 days is three and a half years. So that is why we can say very confidently, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, is the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. So till now, whatever we have read is the first half of the tribulation. Revelation 11, 1, middle. Whatever we are going to read now is going to happen in the second half of the tribulation. The next thing we notice here is, he's talking about the temple of God in Jerusalem, the holy city. So, right now that temple doesn't exist. There is no temple in the holy city. There is a temple mount, but you know, you'd have read it today's news, the last yeah, couple of days, yesterday, today, there's been violence there. The Israeli soldiers have gone into the mosque, uh, you know, because of all the trouble. Uh, this is the holy month of Ramadan, and uh, so the, the Muslims are coming in to pray there, the Jews are opposing it, and there's violence. And it's happening right now, in our time. So, on the Temple Mount, there is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, and that whole uh, place is very sacred to the Muslims. The Jews have access to the Western Wall. So there is no Jewish temple there. So that's why we we say that, that's one of the reasons we say that there has to be a third temple. Some people call it the tribulation temple or the third temple. So Solomon built the temple. We refer to that as the first temple. That was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. It was rebuilt uh, during Ezra and Nehemiah's time. So that's called, referred to as the second temple. That was then destroyed later on around uh, by the Arabs around 600 AD, which at that time they built the, the mosque and they took over the whole place. So since that time, there's been no temple. But here, Revelation 11 says there has to be a temple. It says, go measure the temple of God. Go measure. That means there's a physical temple. That's how will we measure it. It's not a spiritual. It's not a, you know, just a gathering of people. It's a physical. Because it says, go measure it. And the other reasons we say it has to be physical is because when you look at Daniel, Daniel says that this man the Antichrist, uh, he stops the offerings and the sacrifices in the temple, which means the temple had, was fully functional up until this time. So that's why we say that from the beginning of the tribulation till Revelation 11, the temple is in place and is operational with sacrifices being offered. But by the time we reach Revelation 11, verse 1, what do we read? We read that the holy city of Jerusalem has been given over to the Gentiles. That means uh, the Gentiles have moved into the city. 
Uh, the temple is there, it's functioning, but at some point here, in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to stop the sacrifices and he's going to set himself up as God. That's coming up in chapter 13. We will see that. So, Revelation chapter 11, middle of the tribulation, a functioning temple is in existence. The Gentiles have taken over Jerusalem. They're controlling the city of Jerusalem. And at this time, verse 4, or verse 3 and 4, there are two witnesses whom God raises up. And they are going to be ministering for 1260 days. That means they're going to be ministering the second half of the tribulation. They will be on the earth for three and a half years, about the second half of the tribulation. So, let's pause here. We'll come back and pick up from verse 3 and talk about these two witnesses. Right. So we'll take our 10-minute break and we will come back and talk about these two witnesses. Thank you. <laughs> 